many people don't really understand why they were saved. And many people don't understand that salvation is not just words that you say. It is believing. What do you believe in? The blood. And today I want to tell you how powerful this blood that you believed in is like. You see, many religions out there, they will tell you, it's all about being, you know, religious, just being in a church somewhere, just being here or being there or being here or doing this kind of alms, going to church, being pious and all that. But <laughs> the most powerful thing that you could ever imagine is the blood of Jesus. This blood, my friend, today I'm just going to open up your eyes in a way that you'll never imagined to tell you how and what the blood of Jesus did for you. And if you understand the power which is in this blood, then you cannot be shaken by small, small things like what we, we saw the other day here in Kenya. They just announced, um, if, if you've not gotten this by 21st of December, then you're locked out from everything. You're locked out from everything. You cannot, you cannot travel. Uh, you cannot use the train, you cannot use the buses, you cannot renew your driving license, you cannot uh, 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 get even your, your, your tax return things, you know, everything is like, even, you can't even drive your own car, you can't do anything, you can't enter anywhere. That's what they said. Do you think I'm afraid? No, no, even so come Lord Jesus. We don't really care about what they're saying because these things have to happen. The most important thing is we know where we belong and we know whom we have believed. Even if they lock me up, it's okay. I'll go and preach in the prison. Even if what happens. And, uh, and, and in Kenya, we have about five, maybe three million people or five million people who have gotten this thing. What about the other 48 million? Because Kenya, we're almost 50 million. Huh? What about the other 48 million people? Now you're going to lock them up? Do you think people, do you think we pay taxes so that, uh, uh, you know, our taxes? How, how does my driving my car has to do with, uh, you know, this thing? You see, Satan is just blatantly showing himself in the face. Showing himself, this is me, I'm coming to... When I look at those people speaking, they just see demons speaking. I see clones speaking. And I'm like, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And you, you're not going to tell me nothing. Because <laughs> I'm purchased by the blood of Jesus. The blood that I'm about to speak about here, okay? So they can do whatever they want. They can destroy the body, but they can't destroy the soul. Let it be known to you. To you, minister of health, that will not bow to your gods, neither will we worship them. Okay? So anyway, having spoken that, let me speak about the blood of Jesus and what it actually did for us. Because the Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we knew nothing, while we were dead in our pit, in, in that hall, Christ died for us. He gave us a life. So why did he have to shed his blood? Now, let me, let me show you a few verses. And these verses are going to encourage you. This is going to be a very interesting teaching today, okay? Just stick with me, please, okay? Now, the first thing you have to understand is that when Jesus shed his blood, my debt was paid once and for all. I was full of, I was indebted. I was full of sin. I was a dead man walking, but my debt was paid by the blood that he shed. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. You will, if you eagerly wait for Jesus, you will appear with no sin. Why? Because my sin was paid once and for all. I'm not going to die again. The Bible says it is appointed for man to die once, and after that judgment. So 2,000 years ago, I died with Christ. The moment I believed in Jesus, it's like I died 2,000 years ago with him. He gave me his life and I gave him my death. And that was it. So I'm not going to die again. Now Christians don't die. They only sleep. But if you're wicked, you're going to die in your sins. Number two, I am justified. All right? Do you know what justification means? It, it is as if I just as if I'd never sinned. When God looks at me, he says, okay, this guy has never done anything. He's never done any. Keith, you've never lied, huh? 
You've never done this. You've never. I'm justified. When God looks at me, he, you're justified. Why? Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. You see what justifies is what? The blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. Friends, you're justified. It's as if you never did nothing. You did nothing. You never sinned. You never did anything. You are, you're, you're spotless. When he looks at you, he just sees Jesus walking. Oh, who is that guy who has never sinned? Who, who is that sinless guy walking there? It's me. It's you. Number three, I am forgiven. You see, the blood of Jesus gave us forgiveness. Right now, friends, no matter how much things that you're going to do, you're already forgiven. I'm not saying that people should go killing others. But you are forgiven, my friends. Whether you kill somebody or you kill nobody, you're forgiven. The moment you believed in that blood, you put your, your, your faith in that blood, you're forgiven. Look at this, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. Look at that keyword. We have the forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Friends, do you know you're forgiven? And nobody can take that forgiveness from you. Jesus gave that forgiveness. At the cross he said, it is finished. The payment of your sins, it's, it's forgiven. Everything, I've done it. And you just believe there. And once you believe, there is no condemnation. John 3, 6, uh, 17, 18, it says, uh, those who believe, they are not condemned. There is no condemnation for those who have believed. But if you don't believe, you are condemned already. But if you believe that Jesus did that for me, I was forgiven at the cross. That time I got that forgiveness. Then my friends, you are forgiven. Again, I know one thing, that I'm spared from God's wrath. There's a wrath which is coming, but I'm already spared from it. I'm not going to go through wrath. No, never. Look at Romans 5, 9. Look at what it says. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There's no wrath which is going to come upon you. Why? Because we already saved. The blood of Jesus saved us from all the wrath. You're already spared. So you, you think that you're going to face it rough? You may face it rough in this world, but eternally, no. <laughs> There's no wrath for you. You're already at peace with God. Everything is already changed. Again, I am being spiritually healed. One day, even my flesh will be replaced with an incorruptible body. Every day I'm being healed. I'm being transformed to the image of Christ. You get the point here. Let me read for you 1 Peter 2.24. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, you see, you're dead to sin. Sin has no dominion over you, okay? We, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. My friends, you have been healed. You see when the Bible says that uh, by stripes you are healed. We are not healed only. We are not only talking about sickness, body sickness. We are healed from sickness of sin. Sin was our disease. You see all the problems that we have in this world is because of sin. Sin this, sin that, sin this, sin that. That's why we, we are facing all these troubles. That's why we are killing each other. That's why we are creating diseases to kill each other. All these things that you're seeing is because of sin. So the greatest disease here is sin. But when you believed in Jesus, you are healed from all that. Because you are healed from what? From your sin. You're no longer a sinner. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a sinner no more. He sees somebody different. He sees, wow, this is a perfect person. Let me tell you another one. You are spiritually alive. You are spiritually alive. Do you know you are dead before you got saved? While you are dead in your sins, Christ died for you. Now let me read for you a verse here to show you that you are spiritually alive right now. In John 6 verse 53, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to them, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So what does it mean? So if you drink this blood, how are you going to drink? Are you going to tap on the blood of Jesus and start licking it at the cross? No. Believing in it. How do you impart the blood of Jesus in you? By believing. Believing that that blood Jesus shed was for you. And the moment you do that, then you're spiritually alive. You come alive. And nobody's going to tell you nothing. Okay? Another, another point here. Your judgment has been satisfied and, and God is at peace with you. Your judgment has been satisfied and God is at peace with you. You see, there are many people every day, they are waking up and saying, oh, you did this wrong. You see, God is angry with you. God is angry. With you. God is angry at nobody. God is angry at nobody. He already crushed everything. He already crushed everything on his son, Jesus Christ. And now he's at peace. It is only you going to hell because you never believe that. Let me read for you this verse. Isaiah 53 verse 5. It says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Why was he wounded? For your transgressions. Now, let me, put it, let me, let me give you a good example. Think about this. There is this... Um, Maybe somebody comes to your house and beats your wife. And uh, he beats your wife and, you know, scars everywhere. And, and you're angry. You're like, this guy, what did he do? And then, let's say you just, you're not, you're not a Christian, huh? And you want to do justice by your own way. And you go somewhere and you find his wife somewhere. You beat her and you do the same thing. Will you still be angry at the man? No. You already poured your anger on, the, on his wife. So you just be looking at him and say, hey, bro, how are you doing? Hey, he's wondering, how come you're not angry with me? Yeah, because I poured my anger on your wife also. <laughs> you get the point? I'm just trying to use crazy ideas here to show you how, how God is no longer angry with you. He was angry with you. Who, who is that kid sinning? And then when Jesus came, he poured all his anger on his son, Jesus. And then now he looks at you and he's like, eh, eh, okay, what are you doing there? Yeah, I was just lying. Yeah, I'm not even angry. Because I already poured all my anger on someone else who is Jesus. And if you believe in him, then the, this will not, you know, there's, there's no condemnation for you. I, I wonder why people don't understand this. People don't get this point. There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are trying to condemn you, it doesn't work like that, okay? Let me tell you something else. The bloodstream of his people, Israel, will be purged. The people of Israel, you think that God is done with them? For those who say, oh, the church is the new Israel, Catholic is the new Israel, blah, 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 blah. No. No, no, it's not like that. The bloodstream of his people, Israel, shall be purged. Look at the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 21. It says, For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the, do for the Lord dwells in Zion. I'm going to cleanse their blood. One day all Israel shall be saved. The book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 25, it tells us one day all Israel shall be saved. You're looking at them and you're saying, Oh, God is done with them. Let me tell you, the gifts of God are without repentance. He promised Abraham that I'll make you a father of many. Your seed shall be, shall be, shall be. Do you think God is going to break that? If God himself even chasing Satan from heaven, he did not take away his gifts, his power, and all the lies and everything that uh, Satan does is because he still has the power. He still has the beauty. That's why Satan can disguise himself as the angel of light. Why did God pick all that? Because God does not pick what he has given his gifts are without repentance. When he gives you salvation, he's not going to pick that salvation. Jesus said, those that God has given me, the Father has given to me, I will lose none. He's neither going to lose you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. Remember the story of Hosea. Over and over, I give this story. God telling Hosea, go and marry that prostitute woman, that wife, that gomer who is always running after other men, after these and these. And, and over and over, 
She's running away, Hosea picks her. He's running away, Hosea picks her up. And Hosea is asking God, why are you giving me all this hassle, God? And God is like, Hosea, I want to show you my kind of love. This is how you run away. This is how my people are running away from me. And I still pick them up in their, in their prostitution, their, all those kind of things. I pick them up because I love them much. Okay? So he's not going to leave you. Don't be lied by the enemy here and telling you, oh, because, because you lost your job, now God has gone. Because you did this, oh, you see the kind of problem because some, someone died in your village. Oh, God, now I'm next. No, you're not next. Think about Job. What did Job do? Job did nothing. He was a good man. He loved people. He, he, he gave to the poor. He, he prayed every time. And he went through trials and tribulations. And he overcame. He was like, it doesn't matter. Even his own wife told him, hey, just cast God and die. He said, no, no, no. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to respect God. I'm going to pray to him. What if he wanted me to? You see? And he won the battle. Friends, are you going to win the battle? Listen to this. Another point. I am cleansed. There are those who think that uh, you're still dirty. No, you're not dirty. There are people who wake up in the morning and they say, the way I feel, I did what yesterday. Oh, I feel this. I feel this. My, my friend, it's only your conscience. It's only your heart telling you those things. <laughs> you're cleansed. As a matter of fact, God sees nothing. You're cleansed. You have no sin with you because there's no longer sin. There's no longer condemnation. My point is not to tell people keep on doing sinful things, but I want to show you the grace of God. To show you the grace of God. You're cleansed. You see, the heart of man is wicked. The Bible says, who can understand it? Because the heart will give you all kinds of things. <laughs> the way I'm feeling is like God is far away from me. The way I'm feeling. Let me ask you. If your mother does not pick your phone call for two days, does it mean that she doesn't love you? No, she does. <laughs> like, like my mother is always throwing a mobile phone in the, in the farm. She left it at the rooftop somewhere. She left it here. She left it while washing clothes. Sometimes she doesn't pick my phone call. Uh, but, I, but I'm assured that she loves me. So will I start saying, oh, she didn't pick my phone calls two times. Then I think, I shouldn't think she's done with me. No, no. I know her. The same thing with God. I, I know whom I believed. He's faithful and he's true. He doesn't pick my phone call today. He's just maybe watching. He's just watching and saying, hmm, let me see this son of mine. How he's going to behave if I don't pick his phone call to, for two days. That's exactly how God is. You get the point here? Now listen to this about being cleansed. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin the blood of jesus is cleansing you every day from all sin from all sin is cleansing you something else i have the power to overcome the enemy in christ jesus with the blood that he shed for me i have power to overcome the enemy you have the power to resist the devil and he flees from you. Listen to this. Revelation 12 verse 11. The Bible says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death. What did they overcome with? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Friends, the blood of Jesus Christ can help you overcome the enemy, overcome every situation. There is power in the blood power in the blood okay something else you're no longer under the curse of the law the law was just bringing a curse on you the law was to show you what sin is the law was is, is like a constitution to tell you hey in this country you can not smoke weed all right in this country we don't smoke weed that's in the constitution so when you're caught smoking weed then what happens you're going to be taken to jail. The other countries will say, yeah, here, here in this area, you can smoke as you want because the law does not apply that. So now, when we come to the law of God, he's trying to explain to you, in God's kingdom, we don't 
lie. In God's kingdom, we don't kill. In God's kingdom, we don't do this. So th- the law was to show you what sin is. The law is holy, all right? But now, after you know, then the law shows you, then because you cannot fulfill all these things, you have your desires, you have your issues, you have your failures, then there is someone who can fulfill everything that the law demands. All you need to do is believe in him, Jesus Christ. And then now that you believe in Jesus, he has fulfilled the law for you. So you don't need to fulfill any. (laughs) You get the point here. So if your trust is in Jesus, then you are no longer under the law. You are under grace. So Jesus does all the heavy work and you're behind him. You're like, Jesus, fulfill the law for me. Jesus, I'm behind you. You do the work. Do the heavy work for me. Me, I'm behind you. I I can't stop lying. I can't stop doing this. But Jesus, you did everything for me. So my trust is in you. What is sin? I always ask people, what is sin? The Bible tells us sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. When you transgress the law, when you go against the law, then you you have sinned. So now, if you're no longer under the law, then what does that tell you? That there is no sin for you. What have you done? No, me, I'm not all. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So, so you, you thought I lied? No, just me. I'm behind Jesus. I'm behind him. So ask him. Me, I'm behind him. He did everything for me. He didn't lie for me. He didn't kill for me. He didn't. He did everything for me. So me, I'm just here. I know I can do nothing by my own. I'm just behind. That's how beautiful the blood of Jesus did for us. All right? <clears throat> I'm getting the point. I'm no longer under the curse of the law. Let me read your verse on this. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Him, he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus took everything. He's the one who took, do not sin, do not kill, do not this, do not this, do not this. He took it for us and he fulfilled it. And I wonder these Seventh-day Adventist people who try to say, oh, we have to keep the law. If you are a Seventh-day Adventist and you're trying to keep the law, please get out from that cult. If you're trying to keep the law so that you can go to heaven, oh, let me keep the Sabbath. If I don't keep the Sabbath, if I don't, uh, if I eat certain kind of foods, if I drink certain kinds of drinks, if I do this and this and this and this, I should not eat this meat. I should take soya. I should take, come on, go and take your tea. Put some nice milk. Enjoy your, your meal. Enjoy your meat. Enjoy your pork. Don't be held by religion. Religion is just killing you for nothing. Oh, don't eat meat on Fridays, that's Catholics. Don't, don't marry, don't do these, don't do these. Come on, <laughs> you, you're still under the law. <laughs> you're still under the law. And Jesus fulfilled the whole law for us. So, you're only carrying all that trouble for yourself. It's like heavy burdens you're carrying. You're carrying. My friends, if you know the liberty that you are in, we have in Christ Jesus. Oh, man. You can sit down there with drunkards and you drink with them as you share the word of God. You tell them, hey, give me one bottle here. Now, you see Jesus says, eh? and this and this and this and this and this. Eh? and this Because you're in liberty, my friends. You're in liberty in Christ Jesus. So who is trying to scare you with things? Who is trying to scare you with don't eat that, don't drink that, don't do this, don't mix with that, don't do this, don't marry, don't eat. The Bible tells us. A time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want that. They, they want what their itching ears want to hear. No, tell us that this is bad. Tell us that this is bad. We want to walk by that law. And I believe that the Ten Commandments that God gave, the first ones before Moses break, broke, God wrote them. But when Mo- Moses broke them and he was angry and he went back, I believe maybe God could have told Moses, okay, just tell me, what do these people want? Let me just... Let's write what these people want. And wrote, oh, they, they, don't, they want to be told, do not kill. They want to be told. I, I believe that was not the mind of God. I'm not being controversial here. But it's like he gave what these people wanted to hear. You want this? Okay, fine. I'm going to give it to you. But me is all about grace. 
I want to give you a good life. I want to give you liberty. But these people cannot see. They want, they want a harsh thing. They want a harsh thing. No, tell us this. Like we want to feel we are doing something. And God tells you, no, 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 no. I've done everything for you. I'm going to do everything for you. Why do you want to do something? What bigger can you do, you children? What bigger can you do? I'm your father. I can do everything for you. Just trust me. Just hold my hand. Let me take you through this. But people, they want to do something. They want to be seen. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've gone to the church. I've given to the poor. So I'm a good guy. I'm going to heaven. Huh? You want to be seen that you can, you know, I've done this. I'm a good guy. Me, 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 me. I, I. Who else was talking about I, I? Satan. I'll be like the most high. I'll climb to the sides of the north, the mountain of congregation. I will be like the most high. I will do I, I, I. That's exactly the spirit of Satan. Want you to pretend that I'm so huge that I can save myself through my own works. That the blood of Jesus is just nonsense out there. Yeah, that guy just poured his blood. When I see people claiming and saying, Oh, uh, me, I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in Jehovah. I ask them, Oh, okay, uh huh. So Jesus is just a prophet, huh? So Je <laughs> don't, you don't know that how precious the blood of Jesus was? The book of Acts, Paul says, when he's talking to the people, the leaders tell them, take care of God's church. Take care of the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. So if God purchased the church with his own, isn't Jesus God? You see, I don't want to come to this issue debate of Jesus being God or not God. You believe what you want to believe. But let me tell you, the blood of Jesus is powerful. Let me continue. Another point is that I have been reclaimed from the enemy. I've been reclaimed from the enemy. The Bible tells us, Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. We have been reclaimed the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. We have been reclaimed. We were already slaves to sin, slaves to the enemy. We were already had given our allegiance to Satan. When we sinned, he became our master. We became children of disobedience. But now that we believe in Jesus, we are no longer children of disobedience. We have been reclaimed. We have been bought back. We were owned by the devil. He controlled our mind. He controlled our hearts. But now Jesus has given us a new heart and a new mind. He's changed us and he tells us, transform your minds. Renew your minds. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are no longer in that kingdom. Now you have changed. You're a different person. You're bright now. I, I have no, there's no condemnation. All right? Again, I'm no longer a stranger to the covenant of promise. The covenant of promise. You're no longer a stranger to it. Listen to this. Ephesians 2, verse 12 to 13, it says, That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now Christ Jesus, who you once <clears throat> were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You once strangers. You are once, you know, away, departed, separated from God. But because you believed in this blood that Jesus shed for you, you are no longer strangers. Now you are one. It's like Jesus transfused his blood into your veins and he took out your filthy blood and he died with it at the cross. And now the one who lives in you, it's not you. But Christ lives in your veins. Christ lives in your body. That's why the Bible says, offer yourselves. Offer yourselves. Relax your muscles. You see, there's this verse which says uh, uh, in Philippians. In Philippians, I'm trying to remember this verse which says, uh, uh, with fear and trembling. What was what, what's this? What's this verse? Um, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> work out your salvation. So people think that I have to do this, I have to do this. But they don't read the next verse which says, for it is Christ who works in you. For both to will and to, I don't know what it is. It is him who works in you. He's in your veins. He's working, just telling you, relax your body. Relax your body. Let me, let me I'm, I'm, I'm moving, yeah? I'm moving. Let me, let me relax. Relax your body. Yeah, yeah, relax. Yeah, I'm relaxed now. I cannot work. I can work in you now. I can work in you, okay? 
That's exactly how Jesus wants it to be. Relax yourself, for I am walking inside you. I'm in your veins. I'm inside. This is my blood which is inside you. And I want to work out. It is not you who worketh, but it is Christ who works in you. It is him who is working those muscles. He's raising that hand. He's taking you to a fellowship. He's the one who is telling you, now I want you to pray. Now I want you to do this. He's the one working in you. He's working in you. Relax your muscles. He's the one thinking on your behalf. He's the one telling you, tell, tell that person the gospel. He's the one telling you, yeah, you're a good person. I believe in you. Yes, you have no sin. He's telling you, he's speaking in you, he's inside you. But you still think that you're on your own. No, you're not on your own. Again, the final act of public expiation has been made on my behalf. The final act of public expiation has been made on my behalf. Nothing is going to be... Listen to this verse. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Of any creature is in the blood. And I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves. For it is the blood that atones for one's life. It is the blood. So the blood of Jesus was shed for you. If the life is in the blood, then Jesus gave me his blood. He transfused his blood into my veins. All right? What was he doing? He was giving me his life. All right? His life is in me. And I gave out my life, which was my filthy blood, and it was hung at the cross. What else do I have to say? Listen to this. Also something else. I've been moved from the enemy's kingdom into God's kingdom. You've been changed from the enemy's kingdom into God's kingdom. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He triumphed. He did win. He went to hell and back for me. He went there and changed everything. It's like, here I am. Hey, I've come to release all these people. Those people who are held captives because the blood of goats and calves could not be able to take them to heaven. I've come. Where are you? He preached to them in there and told them, now this is the ultimate payment. This is the ultimate sacrifice. And I'm ready to pick you up. And, and, those, and they believed. And, and when he rose up, many saints who were dead, they rose up with him and went to heaven. And now we don't have to go down there. We're going upwards because we have triumphed, all right, with him. Again, I have gained the unmerited favor of God. Do you know you have the unmerited favor of God? Favor which surpasses all understanding? Goodness which surpasses all understanding? Because you're a child of a king. You're a child of God. And now there is no difference between you and Jesus Christ because you are one in Christ. You are in Christ and is in you. And when the Father looks at you, he sees Christ. So what Jesus has is yours also. Listen to this. Ephesians 1, seven. once again. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to what? The riches of his grace. Unmerited favor. The riches of God, they are upon you, okay? Again, you have been declared righteous. My friends, you're no longer a sinner. You're a righteous person in Christ Jesus. Let me read for you 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The one who knew no sin, he became sin. We gave him his blood, our blood, which was filthy, we gave him, Jesus, take this blood, die with it at the cross. Give me your blood, transfuse it into me. I have life, and I've given him my death. And then Jesus died. As a sinner, he died my death. He died my death. That was Jesus dying my death. I gave him my blood, and he died with it. And by the power of God, he was regenerated. Now, my life, which was in my, my blood, which was, I gave to Jesus when he, when he was dying, was generated and my life now is hidden by God in Christ. He still has that blood, but now it has been redeemed. It has been changed. 
powerful and he has it. He has my life and he has given me his life. The one who lives in me is not I, but Christ lives in me. So it's like we exchanged our bloods. He gave me his blood. I took his blood. I gave him my blood. And it's so beautiful that he was so powerful that he could raise himself again. If I could have died without blood, my friends, I could not have raised myself. Because I didn't have the power. But Jesus, I gave him my blood, which was really filthy and wicked and rotten and full of every curse and every kind of sin. And he died with my blood. And he rose with my blood because he had the power. By the Holy Spirit, he rose and he conquered death for me. And he keeps that life in himself. And he gave me his life. Now I'm keeping his life, all right? And he's keeping my life. <laughs> Next change program, huh? <laughs> so I've been declared righteous. Again, you have been justified. Just as though you've never sinned. You've been justified. Romans 3, verse 24 to 25. This is the best verse when it comes to justification. I want you to hear this. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. He passed over. God said, okay, Keith, your sins that you previously committed, let me, let me give to my son. Hey, Jesus, pick these sins. Just, just pick them. Die with them. For me, I'm justified. God poured all his anger on his son, Jesus. And he said, yeah, this one I'm pouring because of Keith, because of Joseph, because of Mary, because of Stella, because of whoever it is, because of that person I'm pouring that anger right now. No, I'm not going to touch Keith. For him is justified. Let me pour that anger there. And after Jesus poured uh, his life for us, God is no longer angry. He's no longer angry with anyone. I've just given you an example. Someone does something wrong to you. You go do something wrong to his kid there or his wife there. Just, I'm not saying you do this, but I'm just giving you an example. You go and pin down his son. He... he Maybe somebody go, went and, uh, you know, slapped your baby. Pa, 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 pa. You, why did you slap my baby? And you meet his baby at the corner. Pa, 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 pa. Now you're no long, longer angry with the man. You already poured your anger there. I'm just giving you an example, right? You get my point. Huh? You're no longer angry. When you look at that man, you're hey, bro, hey, neighbor, how you doing? But this guy is not angry with me. You know what I did to his son? <laughs> no, I already poured my anger on your son out there. Poured my anger on someone else, or I did something to your to your car outside the parking, and that's where I poured my anger. So I'm no longer angry with you. That I want you to get this point. That's why I'm giving some crazy explanations here. Bear with me. Look at this. You are able to come close to God. You are able to come close to God. Listen to Ephesians 2.13. Ephesians 2.13, it says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You people who are very far off, you are very far off, now you have been brought close by the blood of Christ. You are alienated. You are aliens. When God looked at you, those aliens... Those people, I don't care about them. But now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Again, you can participate in the sweet communion of remembrance of his sacrifice. Right now, yeah, you can, definitely. Look at the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 20. It says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in, in my blood, which is shed for you. For you, you accepted it? Yes, for you it was shed. For you, my friends, for you. Listen to this. Your redemption will never perish. 
how do I explain this, my friends? Your redemption will never perish. How many times are we hearing people saying that you can lose your salvation? That, hey, you are redeemed only for a time until you sin again. You are redeemed only for a time until you do this. Oh, you lied yesterday. Ah, 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 ah. Now you're done. My friends, you're done. Let me ask you, in a family, if your child comes to you and says, Dad, I poured sugar on the table. Please, would you be my father again? You'll be like, come on, boy. Are you going nuts? How, pouring sugar on the table, now I'm no longer your dad. How now? I'm your father. Come on, it's... How do you have to tell me those things? These are crazy things you're saying. Are you going nuts? That's how God feels when you've just done something and then you say, oh, I've lost my salvation. Oh, yesterday I did this. Oh, I've lost my salvation. No, no, no. You've been saved once and for all and you're a child of God and you're not losing it and you're in a family of God. Just If you want to understand salvation, take it in the essence of a family. Take it in the essence of a family. How does a family operate? When a child goes and uh, does his own things and smokes weed and get, joins gangs there and is even killed there, who, who buries the child? Who buries that child? It is the family. The father still buries that child. Why? Because the bad deeds, the things that that person does, they add nothing to you being a child in that family. You are a child of that family by default, by birth. You, you are a child of God by being born again. And how to be born again is by believing. All right? The moment you believe, you're born again. You get the point here? The moment you believe, you're born again and you're in a family. And you're not going to lose it from being in a family. You get the point here? So the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, it says, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. Yes, you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you think that you are redeemed by this or that or this or that, by, by your good deeds, by your stopping sinning, you're redeemed because, you, no, no, I, I did not uh, do this. No, you're not redeemed by those things. That is not what gave you salvation. What gave you salvation is the blood of Jesus that you believed in. So now you're in a new family. You, whether you do right or you do wrong, you're a new creature. And that's why you have to be redeemed. You have to be renew your mind. Renew your mind and understand this. I know this is not a message which is preached by many people. Many people want to bind you by the law. They want to pin you down and put um, something in your mouth. That, Keep quiet, you sinner. You sinner, you sinner. You're not a sinner. You're not a sinner. For God's sake, you're not a sinner. God is in peace with you. You're not redeemed by corruptible things like silver or gold or, gold or wax of righteousness or by doing anything. You're redeemed by the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, okay? Another thing here. Jesus testifies, Jesus testifies on your behalf that you're clean. He testifies on your behalf that you are clean. Yeah, this, this guy is clean. This lady is clean. Yes, that's why how he testifies. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, it says... And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us to be kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He made us to be kings and queens. He testifies on your behalf. He says, no, no, this is a king. This is a queen. This is a clean person. This one, I know, no, 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 no. God the Father, I know, I know, I know this guy. I know him. I know him. He's a king. He's clean. He's clean. As a matter of fact, he's clean. He believed in my blood. He's clean. He testifies. When the accuser comes and says, uh, you see, uh, Keith did this yesterday. No, 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 no. <laughs> accuser, hold on. Satan, hold on. I know him. I know him. He's clean. He's done nothing. As a matter of fact, I did everything for him. Now he's just under my wings. He's in the palm of my hands. 
He cannot be lost. Again, you are free. You are free. All right? Listen to Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. The liberty by which Christ has made us what? Free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. How many times are you entangled with the yoke of bondage? Satan is trying to entangle you. He's trying to tell you, no, you're not free. You're not supposed to do this. In our church, you don't do this. In our church, you don't say that. In our church, you don't uh, do like this. You don't dress this. You don't eat this. You don't do this. Yoke of bondage. Go tell those pastors that I'm free. I can eat whatever I want. I can do whatever I want because I'm free. The yoke of bondage is no longer binding me. The reason I do good is not because... I'm supposed to do it for my salvation. No. My doing good is because I want to please the one who gave me this liberty. Good example. Let me give you a good example. The president is above the law. All right? We know that. Here in Kenya, I don't know in other countries, our constitution here, the president is above the law. He's protected. He cannot be persecuted. All right? He cannot be persecuted. If he goes and does something, nobody's going to pick him up and tell him nothing. No. He's above the law. He, he knows he has all the liberty. So does the president just pick a gun and start shooting people in the streets? Yeah. <laughs> I'm above the law. I'm above the law. Shooting people? No. He knows he has the liberty. So should we sin because we have liberty? No. God forbid. Why? Why should you go and shooting people? Because now I know even if I kill that person, I'll, I'll not go to hell. Pa! Pa! You, you guys, I can shoot you and go to heaven. I can steal and go to heaven. No. We have a testimony. It's like when you have everything at your disponible for you, in, put there for you. You have 10 cars. Are you going to drive each and every one of them so that you can show people they are all my cars? No. You just use what you can. Use one car. You can sleep on two beds. You sleep on one. It doesn't matter. You have two beds in the same room. They are yours, but you're not going to sleep here five minutes. You jump, you sleep on the other so that you can show people that, hey, both are my beds. No, just use common sense. So what we do, the reason why we don't sin is because we're using common sense. It's because we know we have all these things for us. We are free. We are in liberty. But when people try to pin you down and tell you, no, you can do this, you can do this, you ask them, huh? Which liberty are you in Christ? Huh? Do you know how much liberty we are in? Don't take me to the yoke of bondage. All right? Again, you are protected from judgment. You will not be judged. You are protected from judgment. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 12, verse 27. Listen to this verse. That you, sh uh, that you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. What does this verse mean? It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed the houses of the children of Israel. God is not after judging you. He passing over judgment from you because you believed in his blood. Just like it was in Egypt, just before the children of Israel left. When they applied that blood in their doorstep, they applied that blood. God passed his judgment to those who did not have the blood. Are you covered by the blood so that you're no longer under God's judgment? You see the point? If you're covered by the blood, then there is no judgment. You're protected from judgment. Why should you be afraid of God's judgment? Listen to this one. You are freed from a conscience defiled by guilt. Do you know there is conscience inside us which is defiled by guilt? What did I just do? Oh, me, 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 poor me, what have I done? But God says, I'm, I've freed you from that conscience. When you understand, because the Bible says you shall know the truth. And the truth will do what? Will set you free. The moment you know the truth, oh, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm no longer condemned. Then you're freed from guilt. You're freed from guilt. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. It says, 
Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us be purged. Change that evil conscience which always tells you that you're a sinner. That conscience which always tells you that, hey, you're going to hell because you did this. You're going to hell because you said that. You're going to hell because you dressed this way. Because you did this, you did this. Get yourself from that evil conscience. Renew your mind. Transform your mind. Because now you're a new creature. You're no longer the old creature. Listen to this again. You're no longer condemned. You're no longer condemned. All right? Listen to this, Romans chapter 8 verse 1. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do walk according, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You're no longer condemned. Who is that person condemning you? Who is that condemning you? Who is that accuser? Who is telling you that you've done this? Who is that accuser telling you that you're a bad person? Tell them, No, no, you're condemning the wrong person. I'm not to be condemned. I know. I've been redeemed. I'm a changed person. I'm a different person. Stop condemning me. Because I am no longer condemned. Condemnation is of the devil. Again, I have been separated from the world and declared holy. How many times do you, do you understand this verse? Understand these words. I'm going to read you the verse in just a minute. That you've been separated from the world and you've been declared holy. Holy, holy into God. Holy, holy. I don't know how to mix those words. Holy in a wholesome way to God. You're holy. You're clean. You've been separated from the world. You're not of the world. Listen to Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. I've been crucified with Christ. Me is not me living. I was crucified 2,000 years ago with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the person that you're looking at right now, is not I. Yeah? Let me read for you. Yeah? The life which now I live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I, it's not me who is living. Me, I was crucified, fellas, 2,000 years ago. I was at that cross. It was Jesus. My blood was in there and the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given him my, my blood to die with it. So it is me who was dying there. Now the one that you're seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm cloned for Christ. I'm just body with Jesus in me. I'm just a clone walking. Huh? My life is there. I'm already dead. This is a clone that you're seeing walking. <laughs> Amazing, right? Again, you can now proclaim total victory. Total victory. How? Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. Again, I read you this verse. And they overcame him. By what? The blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. You can overcame, overcome everything. You're victorious right now in Jesus Christ. You're victorious. Nobody's going to tell you anything. You have the victory in Christ. Two more. Let me read you two more. This is so exciting, huh? You can enter boldly into the holy of holies, into the holiest of the places, and you live. You can enter to the holiest, most place and live. Do you know back in the Old Testament, only one person, the priest, could enter to the holy of holies. And when he entered there to pray for the people, there had to be a rope tied on his feet, all right? So that in case he enters there and he's sinful and he's struck by God and he dies, nobody can get in there to pick him. You have to pull him with a rope because that place is so holy. You have to pick, pull him with a rope outside. But now, are we tying ourselves with the ropes on our legs as we enter Holy of Holies? Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 9 verse chapter 10 verse 19 to 22 it says therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We can enter now. He did everything. Now we are entering with the body of Christ. He is the one we are in. When we are entering to the Holy of Holies, when God looks, is that a sinner entering that Holy of Holies? No, no, no. That's my son, Jesus. Because you are in Christ and he's in you. And when you enter the Holy of Holies, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, entering. He sees Jesus saying all the good things. Oh, I worship you. Oh, thank you, God, for this. He looks and says, oh, that's Jesus. He doesn't even see you. He doesn't see the filthy old you. He sees a new creature. You're a new creature in Christ. You can enter to the Holy of Holies. And those people who try to become mediators between you and God, they tell you, oh, for you to go to Christ, you have to come through me. Me, I'm the only pastor in this village who can pray for you. I'm the only pastor who can tell you about the future. I'm the only pastor this. I'm the only pastor this. Come to me. Come to me. Those are hooligans and fools and hypocrites. Those are useless people trying to bring a barrier between you and God. Brood of vipers. Tell them to go away. Tell them, hey, so you're mediating for who? You? If you're praying together as brothers and sisters in Christ, that, that's okay. But don't start mediating for me. I can enter Holy of Holies by myself. I can talk to God by myself. I can talk to him in the closet. I can talk to him when I'm walking, when I'm driving, when I'm farming, when I'm swimming, when I'm doing anything. Because his Christ is in me and I'm in him. So you're trying to tell me that you're entering Holy of Holies for me. You're a big buffoon. Get away from me. You're a liar and a hypocrite. You get the point here. So don't be lied by people. You're redeemed. You're a new creature. You're in Christ, Jesus. Let me tell you one more. You have further revelation of who God is. Many people don't understand who God is because they are not in him. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. My friends, now we understand who God is. We understand what he did for us. We understand who we have believed. Because when the Holy Spirit is sealed inside us, he teaches us all things. He makes us know the things of God. He tells us, okay, this is how the kingdom of God is like. But them, they don't understand because they are not in Christ Jesus. Because they have not believed in the Son of God, the blood that he shed for us. Jesus was asked by his disciples, Master, tell us, why do you speak in parables? And he said, yeah, I speak in parables because it is appointed for you to know the things of the kingdom. But for them, it's not appointed for them. That's why they will read the whole Bible. They open the Bible. They open the Bible. They are not understanding. Yet to you, you can open one verse and you understand. And you're like, "Woo! God spoke to me through this verse. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Before I got saved, I used to be... I, I used to read the Bible. I try. I try to open them. What are these people enjoying? This book is so hard. It's like I'm reading a fish, fiction book. And thou this, thou this. I don't get what he's speaking. I try to read. It's nothing. But when I got saved, I could just open a verse and voila. This verse is speaking to me. This verse is speaking to me. This verse is speaking to me. Oh God, please, you're confusing me with all these verses. There are so many. Come on, speak one thing. You're speaking so many things to me. Because everything is making sense. Friends, the blood of Jesus is powerful and it cleanses us from all things. I love you guys. Believe the gospel. Believe in the Son of Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Believe in him. I love you guys. I love you so much and enjoy this day, okay?